Hungry raccoons send a woman fleeing from her home, and why are some animals self-domesticating? This week on From Us of Fauna. Spend the next 20 minutes feeding your brain with Formosa fauna so you can learn all about the animal kingdom and become smarter than all of your friends. What better way to spend your commute or downtime? Every Friday is Formosa Fauna Friday. I'm Tristan Hildebrand, the voice of Formosa Fauna. I love animals and I love talking about animals. If you're even remotely curious about animals, you're in the right place. You know, every time I record a new episode, I think... This has got to be my favorite episode so far. I'm actually excited to talk about these things. And today is another one of those days. Today on our agenda, we're going to be talking about raccoons, self-domestication, and keeping pets safe during storms. First up, hungry raccoons cause women to flee her Washington home. You've probably seen cute videos of people feeding wild raccoons on social media. One of the earlier ones I saw was posted a few years ago. It was this man feeding dozens of raccoons hot dogs. On YouTube, he titled his video, Mobbed by Raccoons. That video, posted by James Blackwood, who self-titles himself the Raccoon Whisperer, has amassed over 40 million views on the platform. Other videos show people owning raccoons as pets or feeding them in small groups. Last week, a resident of Kitsap County, Washington, faced an unusual situation when nearly 100 raccoons swarmed her property in search of food. The woman, who had been feeding raccoons for over 38 years, had never seen so many gather at once. She called 911 after the aggressive animals surrounded her home, making it impossible for her to leave. The Kitsap County Sheriff's Office responded and shared footage of the incident. The raccoons had apparently been relatively calm in the past, but the woman said that this newer group of raccoons had become aggressive as of late. The raccoons had been visiting her property daily, scratching at the windows and walls until she fed them. On the day of the incident, deputies arrived, allowing the woman to leave her home, though the raccoons were not aggressive at the time. However, this growing issue has raised concerns about feeding wildlife as it can cause animals to become dependent on humans for food and lead to disease outbreaks. Washington's Department of Fish and Wildlife was notified and advised the woman about the risks associated with feeding the animals. The agency recommended she connect with certified wildlife control operators to address the problem. State law requires that animals trapped by these operators be either released on site or euthanized, but it remains unclear what actions were taken to manage the large group of raccoons in this case. Wildlife officials emphasize that feeding wild animals can alter their behavior, making them more comfortable around humans and potentially attracting predators. The situation serves as a reminder of the dangers of human interaction with wildlife, especially when it comes to creating unnatural feeding patterns. In the wild, raccoons are omnivorous and have a varied diet that includes fruits, nuts, berries, insects, frogs, fish, small mammals, and bird eggs. They are opportunistic feeders, meaning they will eat almost anything available. Raccoons are also known to forage in water, using their dexterous front paws to catch crayfish, snails, and small aquatic animals. Their adaptability in diet allows them to thrive in diverse environments, from forests and wetlands to urban areas. As urbanization increases, it would seem as though more and more raccoon populations are identifying humans as a reliable source of food. Have you ever heard of the term trash panda. <laughs> There's a set of cute nicknames for animals, including ones like danger noodles for snakes. Trash pandas, or raccoons, got their nickname for a reason. The nickname trash panda for raccoons likely comes from their physical resemblance to pandas, first and foremost, and their notorious habit of rummaging through garbage in urban areas. Like pandas, raccoons have a masked face, round bodies, and a similar coloration, leading to the playful comparison. Their scavenging nature and tendency to knock over trash bins make the trash part of the nickname 
rather fitting. The term has gained popularity due to its humor and the raccoon's frequent association with human environments. Society's perception of raccoons has shifted over time from viewing them as primarily pests to seeing them as both nuisances and cultural icons. In more rural areas, they were traditionally considered destructive scavengers, beyond just raiding trash, also for raiding crops. However, with their increasing presence in urban environments, people began to view them with the mix of frustration and affection. Their intelligence, dexterity, and masked appearance have earned them an endearing yet mischievous reputation, even their portrayal in popular media. In films, TV shows, and video games, raccoons are often portrayed as clever and daring, such as Rocket Raccoon from Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. Online content also largely adds to their appeal. Their image has evolved from mere pests to beloved symbols of resilience, intelligence, and comic mischief, reflecting society's complex relationship with wildlife. Raccoons, unfortunately, do not make the best pets. There have been breeding efforts to try to domesticate them, with the hopes that generations born in captivity will become increasingly docile, but the professionals say that raccoons cannot be completely domesticated as things currently stand, and raccoons, when reaching the age of maturity, may abruptly become aggressive and bite people or other pets. As the Skyline Animal Hospital of Utah says, even though they can be friendly, raccoons are never truly docile and can easily turn skittish and aggressive. People who have kept raccoons as pets, either in states where it's legal or illegal, have reported being attacked, even when they thought they'd tame their pet raccoons. Raccoons maintain their wild side even with all of the time, love, and care in the world, and even after having been bred in and raised in captivity for generations. Raccoons also need massive amounts of space. They wouldn't find enough stimulation roaming around a home. In addition to space to climb and explore, they have a natural instinct to rummage, break into secured areas, and as they say, they don't just look like bandits, they act like them too. Raccoons are known for being carriers of several diseases such as rabies, salmonella, roundworm, leptospirosis, and more. They can also have parasites such as lice, fleas, and ticks. In some areas of the world where it is legal to own a pet raccoon, such as in Texas, it is actually illegal to have them neutered, so you would also need to worry about your raccoon making a litter of raccoons if they escape. Raccoons are wild animals, and they are considered exotic pets. So if you did have a pet raccoon, finding a vet who would be able to care for them and treat their sickness or injury could be exceedingly difficult, not to mention expensive. Raccoons are banned as pets in Taiwan, and they do not exist here naturally. On many of the lists online of what animals could be domesticated to become pets next, Raccoons, as far as I can tell, are just nowhere to be found. On the other hand, I see animals such as skunks on there, so skunks are apparently legal to own in many American states. But that's beside the point. On Geographical is an article titled, Why Are Some Wild Animals Becoming Self-Domesticated? Just above the byline showing the author, Curtis Abraham, we see, For several years, scientists have been recording changes in the behaviors of some animals that indicate that they may be going through a process of self-domestication. But why are they doing it? My guess is, before reading the article, uh, because humanity is greatly impacting the environment, unfortunately in many negative ways, forcing species to adapt or die. Because, as Charles Darwin said, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives, it is the one that is most adaptable to change. Instead of lying in wait and anticipation that will fix the habitats that are being struck down, a more reliable method would just be to find out how to rely on people and do so. That's just my guess before looking at the article, but now we can dive into what it says. It talks about how historically, domestication was primarily viewed as a human-driven process involving selective breeding to cultivate traits beneficial for agriculture and companionship. 
Self-domestication, on the other hand, is a natural process that occurs when species adapt to live harmoniously with humans, often leading to reduced aggression and increased tameness. Species like coyotes, foxes, and even some primates are thriving in urban areas across the globe. Take, for instance, coyotes. Coyotes have demonstrated remarkable adaptability, successfully integrating into both rural and urban settings in the United States. Research indicates that urban coyotes exhibit traits associated with self-domestication, such as a decreased fear of humans and changes in physical appearance, including coat color variations and alterations in skull shape. Similarly, studies on red foxes in the UK have shown changes in their skull structure, with urban foxes developing shorter and wider muzzles compared to their rural counterparts. This adaptation may be linked to the availability of new food sources, such as discarded human food, which require different feeding strategies and physical adaptations. At the core of self-domestication lies the concept of reduced reactive aggression, which is considered essential for tameness. The process is thought to involve genetic changes that favor less aggressive behaviors, allowing animals to coexist more peacefully with humans. This phenomenon, termed domestication syndrome, includes not only behavioral traits but also physical changes such as reduced brain size, altered ear shapes, variations in coat patterns, and reduced sexual dimorphism. It was once thought that domestication made animals stupid because they no longer had to make a living in the wild. A science writer and historian, Jared Diamond, surmised that brains got smaller during the domestication process because brains were a waste of energy in the barnyard. The current research regarding this set of physical changes comes to this consensus that they are non-adaptive traits, seemingly unrelated biological traits that have no evolutionary advantage. It would seem as though scientists disagree with Jared Diamond's theory that they just get dumber. Research led by scientists such as Dmitry Balyev, who famously domesticated silver foxes in Russia, has provided valuable insight into how breeding for specific traits can result in a series of unexpected physical and behavioral changes. Balyev's experiments have shown that domesticated animals often exhibit juvenile traits throughout their lives, a process known as pedomorphism. This includes youthful faces with smaller jaws. The implications of self-domestication extend beyond mere curiosity. They hold significant consequences for conservation strategies. Species that can quickly adapt to urban environments are often better positioned to survive in an increasingly human-dominated landscape. For example, urban-dwelling animals may benefit from reduced predation pressures and increased food availability. However, this adaptability comes with risks such as exposure to traffic, pesticides, and human abuse. As is the case with coyotes, where they are considered vermin and hunted ruthlessly in some locations. In conservation contexts, recognizing self domestication can lead to innovative strategies that promote coexistence between wildlife and urban populations. For instance, conservationists could encourage sustainable practices that foster habitats where these self domesticating species can thrive while also minimizing negative interactions with humans. The study of self domestication also prompts deeper questions about the evolutionary processes at play. With urbanization on the rise, understanding how wildlife evolves in response to human activity could shed light on the future of both species and ecosystems. The unique characteristics observed in urban wildlife challenge traditional notions of domestication, suggesting that the pressures of urban life can lead to evolutionary changes similar to those driven by human intervention. As more species demonstrate self-domestication traits, researchers will continue to explore the connections between urbanization and evolution. These investigations not only enhance our understanding of animal behavior, but also inform strategies for managing wildlife in the face of rapid environmental change. Multiple hurricanes are barreling through the southeast United States right now. Rest assured, though, that the Florida Aquarium is transferring its animals, including nine penguins, to safer grounds in anticipation of Hurricane Milton, as reported on by NBC News. We have some safety tips for pet owners, so even if you're not in the situation now, which I really hope that you are not, if you are ever in a similar situation in the future, you will be better equipped to handle it. So 
The American FDA states that during hurricanes and floods, the best thing you can do for your pets is to plan ahead. Bring your pets indoors as soon as local authorities say a storm is coming and have your pet emergency preparedness kit ready. It sounds silly. Many of us probably don't even have a human medical kit on hand, which we probably should. But these kits include a bin, a week's worth of food and drinking water for your pet, medications, copies of vaccinations and medical records, information about your pet insurance policy if you have one, a leash, and photos of you with your pet. I thought that last one was just a cute quirky thing, but apparently it helps to identify you or your pet if you are to ever get separated. What's also super handy if you are ever to get separated is having your pet chipped. You should always stay indoors on the lowest level during storms in a small interior room, closet, or hallway with few or no windows, and keep as far away from windows, skylights, and glass doors as possible. Even better if you can have multiple walls between you and the outside. If flooding threatens your home, turn off all electricity at the main breaker. Use flashlights as your light source instead of candles or kerosene lamps, and turn off all major appliances. The eye of the storm is the brief period of calm during which some people are tempted to go outside, perhaps take your dog out on a walk or to go to the bathroom, but you should avoid doing so at all costs because once it passes, wind speed rapidly returns to hurricane force winds. All of that debris just becomes missiles. You can also put your animals in a crate, carrier, kennel, or even bathtub if those are unavailable, covering you and then with a mattress to protect from debris if pieces of your home start breaking free. It is important to remember that the ultimate goal is to keep pets calm, protected, and sheltered while the storm runs its course. With a bit of planning, hopefully you can ensure you and your pets stay together and stay unharmed even through the harshest of storms. Have you ever had a memorable experience with an animal? Whether it's an observation at the zoo, an interaction with a wild animal, or the thousands of stories you could share as a pet owner, I want to hear about it. If you're a fan of snail mail, please send me letters via the post. And if you're more digital, please send me an email. That way I can read it on air to share with all of our lovely Formosa Fauna friends. It could be the simplest thing, and as long as it has an animal in the story, I will like it because after all, if it means something to you, it also means something to me. If you're sending in a letter, the address can be found online. Just look for the Radio Taiwan International address. Write your emails to tristan at rti.org.tw. If you want to share, but you're not sure what to say, so you're, you're hesitating a little bit, I can share one of my own stories from this week. That way you have an idea. It's just something new. It's not the most spectacular story in the world, but it is something and it means something to me. I tell you that much. This past week, I happened to run across a little kitten. This kitten, I'm not sure how many weeks old he is, but he still needs milk and he is so small that his back legs can't even like stand up yet. Kittens that need to be fed milk need to be fed actually, I think every three to four hours every day all day, which means no sleep. I was only responsible for caring for this kitten for about 24 hours, but this 24 hours was probably the most stressful and tiring 24 hours of my life. Honestly, it's not a lot of work aside from putting the bottle in their mouth and making sure they eat a little bit. You got to kind of pat their butts, make sure they go to the bathroom. But what was just so tiring for me was the stress of thinking, did something happen to the kitten? And always being stressed out. So even half a day after the kitten had left my home, I was still having these like, <laughs> these sudden urges of like, oh my God, did I forget the kitten? <laughs> but the kitten had already left. Really, just a shout out to all of the people who do such amazing work. The girl who took this kitten is now taking care of this kitten for likely another month. And will be doing this 24 hours round the clock, nonstop work for this little beautiful tiny soul making it to the end of an episode makes you a formosa fauna friend thank you for tuning in friend all animals require enrichment and formosa fauna is just that after all we're all just a bunch of wild animals 
See you next time. More from Osofana Fridays here on Radio Taiwan International.